Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our worship service this morning. We give a special welcome to our visitors. If you're new in the Springfield Clark County area or looking for a new church home, we invite you to make St. John's your new church home. In regards to our worship, you will see that the entire service is back in the bulletin. Uh, the only thing we need your hymnal for is for the singing of the hymns. Uh, this is due to the overwhelming unhappiness with setting one, which we were using. Uh, we'd gone to setting one because we didn't have to keep flipping back and forth from pages, but as one person told me, they were to flip pages and sing the setting one. So uh, we are now back to what is easier to sing and more familiar with us. Uh, and as I say, you only need the hymnal for the hymns. So let us open our bulletins to page two. And I invite those who can, without difficulty, to please stand as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship of the order of confession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most Church, Springfield, Ohio. This is December the 17th, the second Sunday in Advent. We will have the lighting of the Advent wreath. Later in the service, by Nelson and Linda Smith. Wait for that. For right now, we've had confessions of sin. We're confessing. Later on, we will uh, proclaim our profession of faith, repent, believe, love God, love one another. This hymn is an Advent hymn, second Sunday of Advent. We'll light two purple candles today. Prepare the Royal Highway. We're now having the procession. Prepare the Royal Highway was written by Francis Michael Franken, 1772-1847. Prepare the Royal Highway, Advent, Second Sunday of Advent, Him.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Two purple candles today. This is the second Sunday of Advent, December the 7th, 2014. We're preparing for Christmas for Jesus coming into the world. Our theme today is stir up our hearts, Lord God, to prepare the way for your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world, the incarnation. Now we're going to sing lighting of the Advent wreath, light uh, one, two candles to watch for Messiah. We praise you, O God, for this circle of light that marks our days of preparation for Christ's day. As we light the candles on this roof, kingdom them within us a fire of your spirit, that we may be light shining in the darkness. Enlighten us with your grace, that we may welcome others as you have welcomed us. Grant this through Christ our Lord, whose coming is certain, and whose day draws in. Now sing verse 2 of light one candle to a is reading the scripture today. Then we'll have the psalm First and Isaiah, then the gospel. Chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. <coughs> A reading from Isaiah. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her. And she has, that she has served her turn, that her penalty is paid. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. 
The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all the people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All the people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of all good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of all good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Says to the, say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm moves for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will be his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. The word of the Lord. Love 
God, love one another and be saved. Special music by the choir. The director is Vicki Perks.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Should Christmas be vain? When we look at the materialistic and hedonistic practices that have surrounded Christmas in our culture, there could be those who would think that maybe the 17th century Puritans had it right. You see, in the 17th century, when the Puritans came to power in England through Cromwell, they outlawed Christmas. Because Christmas had become a day not of people going to church and singing glorious carols to God for the birth of His Son. Christmas had become a day of wild drinking, partying, carousing, mischief making, and carrying on. When the Puritans came to Massachusetts, set up their colonies, they continued to outlaw Christmas in New England. And as our nation began to grow, this influence of the Puritans spread beyond New England into the, many of the other colonies. And to many of them, once the uh, nation won its independence and became the United States, other states began to be added, Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, and Indiana, and the others. The influence of the Puritans continued all the way up until the 1870s. So in many areas, Christmas was bad. Now for the, Ang the Anglicans, who then became Episcopalians, for the Roman Catholics, and for the Lutheran immigrants coming to this country, this posed for them a difficult problem because they were used to going to church for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. They were used to set aside that day of not working, closing their shops, of not doing any labor, but giving thanks to God for the wonderful gift of His Son, Jesus Christ. But after 1870, things changed, the laws were abolished, and General Grant, once he became President Grant, made Christmas a national holiday, or a federal holiday. And so here we are in the 21st century, in the year 2014, and as we look at Christmas, we wonder, did the Puritans have the right idea? As we go into stores and see fewer and fewer signs of what Christmas is really all about, oh, we see plenty of candy canes, see plenty of reindeer, see plenty of Santa Clauses, see plenty of Christmas trees and sleighs, but you don't see very many nativity scenes. You don't see many stars or wise men or shepherds. So as we look around and we see how some people use Christmas just to go into debt, which takes them a year to pay off, to have parties and carrying on, we have to wonder, should we be if the only gospel we had in existence was the gospel of St. Mark, some people might think that was evidence there for not having Christmas. Because it doesn't take you long in reading the first chapter of St. Mark to realize St. Mark gives us no indication, no information, no description of the birth of Jesus Christ. In the gospel of Mark, we meet Jesus as a 30-year-old adult coming to John the Baptist to be baptized. If you just take a survey of the first chapter, uh, you have first the ministry of John the Baptist, then the baptism of Jesus, the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, beginning of his Galilean ministry, calling the first disciples, healing the man with the unclean spirit, being at Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house, preaching to her in Galilee, and cleansing love. Nothing about the baby of Bethlehem. And as St. Mark begins his gospel, he begins it with these words in that first verse, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's it. Nothing about angels or shepherds or a manger or no in or a census or strangers from the east, a star guiding them, shepherds out the 
fields watching their flock by night. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Is St. Mark anti-Christmas? Is St. Mark telling us that we shouldn't recognize Christmas? Now, on first reading, you may think that St. Mark gives you an ammunition for just such a statement. But the reality is, St. Mark is not saying no way with Christmas. St. Mark is not supported with Christmas. What St. Mark is doing is telling us what is most important about Christmas. He is calling us back to focus on the true meaning of what Christmas was all about. He is calling us back to look at why we have this Advent season, this season of preparation. Why it is so important to keep in mind not only Jesus' first coming as the baby in Bethlehem, but also to be aware of his second coming in glory. And so this morning we are going to look and see what St. Mark is actually telling us about the importance of Christmas. The beginning of the good news. Now, most scholars believe that St. Mark is the very first gospel that was written. Now, think about that. And think about the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. Genesis begins, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The gospel of Mark begins, the beginning of the good news. The word beginning it means the initiator, the starting point, the founder. It means to be the first. It means to be the cause or power that causes something to be. In Genesis, God is the initiator of creation. God is the founder of the creation. God is first. God is the power that causes creation to happen. In the Gospel of Mark, it is Jesus Christ who is the power, who is the cause, who is the initiator, who is the foundation of salvation for the world. So as we look at the Gospel of St. Mark, St. Mark is telling us what Christmas is really all about. And if we understand what Christmas is really all about, then we would never want it to be made. If we understand what Christmas is really all about, we would never sit still when somebody desecrates our Christmas, when desecrates the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we would stand up to defend our Lord Jesus Christ and what Christmas is all about. There's a radio station toward the far end of your FM dial. They call themselves the Christmas station for the Miami Valley. I challenge you to listen to it. In an hour's time, you may hear little Grumble Boy. In an hour's time, you may hear, do you hear what I hear? In another hour's time, you may hear, hopefully not. The rest of those hours, you're going to hear Frosty the Snowman, nothing to do with Christmas. You're going to hear Jingle Bells, nothing to do with you're going to hear that whiny, smarmy song. Oh, it's cold outside. Baby, don't go. Oh, it's cold outside. Baby, don't go. Or you're going to hear the one about how if you just hug your tight, it's winter. The snow is falling, but hug me tight. I'll be warm all the way home. Those are winter songs. Those are glorified winter. Those aren't Christmas songs. They don't have anything to do with the birth of Christ. They don't have anything to do with what happened that first Christmas. They don't have anything to do with proclaiming Jesus Christ as Savior the world. And yet they're calling themselves a Christmas station. So what we need to do is we need to flood them with emails, since that's the new way to go, or I guess Instagrams, text messages, whatever, Facebook, go on our Facebook page and tell them, how about playing some real Christmas music? Where's, oh come on you faith, where's joy to the world? Where's the angels we have heard on high? Where's a way in a manger? Where's silent night? Where's the first Noel? Those are Christmas songs. That's what Christmas is all about. And that's what St. Mark wants you to understand. It's the true meaning of Christmas. First thing he is telling us that that baby born in Bethlehem, that first Christmas, is the Son of God. 
He's not just any baby. He's not just another prophet of all line of prophets. He's not a new moral teacher. He's not a lawgiver. He's not a mystic. He's not a philosopher. He's the Son of God. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now when we turn to the first chapter of the Gospel of St. John, St. John gives us the theological Christmas story. He tells us, like St. Mark, what really happened. That what we have happening is the Son of God coming down to earth. In the early church, Christmas was designated not as Christmas, but as the festival of the Incarnation. Or the celebration of the Incarnation. Incarnation is a Latin word. It means God taking on human form. It means to take on flesh. It means God to take on human flesh and to live among His people. So when you, when you use that term Incarnation, then you have no mistake what Christmas is all about. It's God coming down to us in human form. So this is why St. John says in the first five verses, of his first chapter. In the beginning, again he says in the beginning, it's like Genesis and St. Mark, in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What is coming to being in, in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness shall not overcome. And the Word became flesh and lived above us, verse 14, and we have beheld, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. So the first thing, the first importance of Christmas is that it was the Son of God who was in that manger. It was the Son of God who was placed in that feeding trough for cattle who would become the bread of life for the world. It was the Son of God who left all that glory of heaven, all that prestige of heaven, and forsook all that to come down to earth, to live among us full of grace and truth. As St. John said, we beheld his glory, and glory is the only Son of the Father. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross, as St. Paul tells us in full. So it was the Son of God when you understand that Christmas is about the incarnation of God coming down to us in the form of a son taking on human flesh, you would not want Christmas to be that. And you would understand what Christmas is all about. And then he tells us, after he tells us who was born, he tells us why he was born. The beginning of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yeshua, Yeshua, Christopher, Jesus the Christ. The word Christ means the anointed one. As it came to mean in the Christian community, not just the anointed one, meaning the long-awaited Messiah, but the anointed one who comes to save. Just as had been proclaimed by the angel. Mary would bear a child who would come to save the world. So that little baby in Bethlehem is the Savior of the world, the Redeemer of the world. Why he came is explained so easily, so simply, in what we Luther called the Gospel in a nutshell. John 3.16, you all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God so loved the world. That is why Jesus came. As St. Paul, or St. Peter told us in our second reading, to God, to God a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. He's not slow on his promise like we think of slowness, because he, uh, he wants that you get more time so that all people might come unto salvation. 
Jesus came because God loves us so much, he wants us all to be with him in eternity. He doesn't want anyone left out. He doesn't want anyone to go to that place prepared for Satan and his angels. But there are those people who just will not listen, who will not accept God's grace, will not accept the fact that why Jesus came was to save the world from sin, death, and the power of death. Come into the world so that instead of being carrying a heavy burden to try to earn salvation like the religion of the world, we are given eternal life through grace, through faith, simply believing in what Jesus has done for us. And so Christmas should never be made. Because it's all about who was born and why. He was born to save us. He was born to set us free from sin, death, and the power of the devil. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus also empowers us in the Holy Spirit. So like his apostles, first apostles, empowers us to go out and share the good news of the gospel with others. Jesus didn't call the apostles just to save them. He called them to save them and then to send them out. So that they could... Uh, share with people the good news. And we are called to be the same. The biggest mistake Satan has put upon the church is a mistaken belief that the only one responsible for spreading the good news of the missionaries, the evangelists, and the preachers it is the responsibility of each and every Christian to invite the non-Christian to come to church. To invite the non-Christian to come and see. To invite the non-Christian to have that opportunity to be called by the Holy Spirit through the gospel. To come and receive that gift of God's grace. To become part of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is important that we fulfill this obligation. Because one day, Jesus will return. As St. Peter said in our second reading, he will come like a thief in the night. We have no way of knowing when he will come. But when he comes, then it will be too late. You will not have a second chance. When Jesus comes again, it will not be in humility. It will not be a baby born in a manger because there was no room in the end. He will come in his full glory of heavenly power that he left to come down. He will come. The trumpet will sound. The heavens will open. The angels will descend. And then will come Jesus in all his glory. This time not a saint. But as the one who separates the sheep from the goats. In a frontier town. A buckboard wagon. Broke loose from its hitching post. In front of the general store. Began to run down the main street. In that buckboard was a little five-year-old boy screaming for his, for his life, scared, petrified. A man in a store saw what was going on and ran out and risking his own life. He ran down the horse and grabbed hold of the reins and brought that wagon to a safe stop. So the little boy was unharmed. Well, the young boy grew up into a young adult and he became an outlaw. It was a lawless man who cared not for person or law or thing. He found he was captured. He was brought to trial. When he walked into the courtroom, he recognized the judge as being the man who had saved him so many years before. When it came time for sentencing, the young man brought up that incident, hoping that it would, he would encourage the judge to have mercy on him since he had saved him once before. But what the judge answered him, silenced, said to him from the bench, silenced him quickly. The judge looked at the young man square in the eye and he said to him, young man, that day you were remembering I was your city. Today I am your judge and I must sentence you to be hanged. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. We now live in the time of grace, the time when any sinner,
the time when any person, no matter how messed up their life, can come to Jesus and have salvation. But when Jesus comes again, for those rebellious sinners who would not believe in Jesus Christ's death as a payment for their sin, for those rebellious sinners who would not believe that Jesus rose on that third day and descended into heaven 40 days later, for those rebellious sinners who will not accept God's gift of grace. That day of Jesus' return, and you will say, Depart from me, you curse, into the eternal fire. What is important about Christmas is to remember who was born and why they were born. And when we know that the who was the Son of God and that the why was for the salvation of the world, then we would never ever agree with the Puritans and name Christmas. But instead, we should use all of our energy to proclaim the true meaning of Christmas even loud to a world that is in severe need of salvation. So St. Mark may not record all the details of Jesus' birth, but he is telling us what happened that first the Son of God who came down to earth to redeem us from sin, death, and the devil and give to us everlasting life. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to turn to page 5 in your worship bulletin. I invite those who came without difficulty to please stand.
the Lord we pray. Come, Lord Jesus. We all await the return of your Son, our crucified and risen Lord. But for some of us, the need is immediate and urgent. Grant healing and hope to all who suffer illness, disability, or the loss of a loved one or job. Let them see the hands of those who help them. <clears throat> Let them see in the hands of those who help them your never failing love, and in their eyes the light of your everlasting mercy. O Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus. O Lord our God, relieve the fears of those who face death. Teach them to trust you more each day that you lead them through that shattered battle, that they may rest comfortably in your promises of mercy and salvation. We ask for grace and everlasting compassion for the families of all who grieve for their death. Open our ears to your word that we may with patience await with all your faithful people the day of our Lord's return and the advent of the new heaven and earth. O Lord, we pray. Come, Lord Jesus. Into your hands, O God of our salvation, we commend all for whom we pray, including ourselves, trusting in your steadfast love as shown us by your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now time for an offering. Our organist will play the variations on Vini Emmanuel. Offering is received. The Lord's table is prepared. Our ushers are John and Karen Dietrich. Uh, this past week, I'm Dr. Sally Abbott, and this past week I was uh, in an accident. And uh, thanks be to God that I was not injured seriously. But I did reach down and took my pulse and spoke to God, and God asked me to give a testimony as to my life, I do have cancer. I've lived for 14 years with the cancer. I was supposed to have died within one year, but there are things for me to do that God has for me to do, and you should ask and pray to God. There are things for you to do, too. We'd love to have you here worshiping with us. We love you. We need you. We feed 10,000 meals a month for the homeless. We want you to worship with us. We accept your position as a child of God. Ask for healing. I was healed. I've been alive on this earth for 13 years. It should have only been one year. You can receive God's favor, His healing, be a son, be a or daughter of God, a child of God, brother of Jesus Christ. Our flowers today are brought to you by Gina and Pastor Pollock in honor of Matt and Sarah's wedding anniversary on December the 8th. Les and Cindy Pearson, family and member of Bill the Salon on his birthday. And on the baptism of James Caven, C A B E N Caven, James Gregory Caven, from the Stump family, the fifth generation family member to be baptized at St. John's. So, three groups of flowers today. And those are the ones that I wanted to tell you that we have. We have the acolyte, we have the ushers going forward, and this is uh, the end of the offertory. We'll now start very much holy time when we receive Holy Communion, we receive the real presence. And during the Holy, 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 we believe that there's a great cloud of witnesses who's watching us with the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of love and running the race that we are, as long as God gives us life, as long as we have a pulse, we're to run the race. We have the great cloud of witnesses here with us around the altar and also in heaven cheering us on.
Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup was a new covenant, my blood shed to and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is died, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ, Christ will come again. again. With this bread and cup, we remember your word dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. We remember our new birth in his death and resurrection. We look with hope for his coming. Come, Amen. Lord Jesus. Holy God, we long for your spirit. Come among us. Bless us, men. May your word take flesh in us. Awaken your people. Fill us with your life. Bring the gift of peace on earth. Come, Amen. Holy Spirit. Spirit. All praise and glory to O Holy One of Israel, Word of God incarnate, power of the Most High, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom.
I'm so happy that we have Jesus Christ's true presence in our heart. And we have the breath of God. We have God within us, as Jesus has promised. And we receive his body and blood, and we receive eternal life, and that he will be with us to the end of the world, to the end of the age, that we'll never be separated from him. This is his promise. He comes to us in the Holy Communion. He comes to in our heart. We confess, we repent, we ask Jesus to come into our heart. And he is united with us with his body and blood in his sacred heart as he is truly man and truly God. And he came down from heaven to worship us. As you can see now, the pastor and uh, Dimitrov receiving the body and the blood just as Jesus promised us. And we receive eternal life, and we're here united with all those who've gone before us. This hymn was written by Philip Doddridge in 1755. He was the 20th child born of his mother, Monica Doddridge. The first 19 children all died. They died in infancy. He was not in good health, but he was able to found a seminary, become a minister, he wrote this great hymn, Hark the Glad Sound. You probably know his another hymn uh, better, Oh Happy Day That Fixed My Choice. That's also written by Philip Doddridge, 1755, before the American Revolution. The 20th child of Monica Doddridge. He lived, he wrote hymns, he died age 48. He was an educator who founded the seminary. He did great things in his short life. All of us should serve God while we're alive.
thanks for watching St. John's service. We have services at 8 o'clock on Sunday, at 10.30 on Sunday morning. We have Sunday school between. We have services at 6.30 in the chapel. You can receive Holy Communion midweek services. Tune in anytime on Google. You have to get your uh, computer on Google. Then you type in YouTube, St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. We're happy to bring you this service. We also offer a Christian school program, ages 3 and 4, nursery and pre-K. You can call the school office, 325-4311. And the church office uh, is 323-7508. Tune in anytime. Join us for our worship service. We pray that you would repent, love God, love one another. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. He's very willing. All he has to do is to be asked. Then he'll be with you. He'll give you his favor. You will have his presence. Come worship with us. Receive his true presence. He has all sorts of ways fixed for you. That you can worship him and be with him. I'll keep you in my prayers. And you keep me in your prayers. We pray for you. Continue to pray for us and our ministry. I'm thankful to God that my life is saved again. I've been 14 years treating cancer. I should have been dead in a year. Thanks be to God. I still have a pulse when I wake up in the morning.